last we talked, I did a, uh, a video on a device called the Boyer's Float that I wound up just pulling because of various reasons. Um, four people saw it, but really, because what I'm talking about, or what I was talking about in that video, I'm going to be discussing in my book and a more organized approach, I wound up just kind of shelving it on YouTube. That's neither here nor there. Well, my book is finished. It's about 200 pages of bow making information. I thought I'd just kind of go through and explain a little bit about it and also um, uh, my methodology. And a good place to start would be, I'm going to try my best not to say um as much, is just, let me creep up here, is uh, the cover page. And this is a book on primitive archery making bows. Not arrows. I'm not touching on arrows. I make arrows, but this is the bow side of it. And the first page, I hope you can see that. A bow maker's notebook, and that's how I'm approaching it. Not like a book, but as a notebook, as we all should be doing if we're involved in primitive archery, is writing down your experiences, your um, tips, your tricks that you learned, is a, is a written record of, of your progress and what you've achieved thus far. And so this is my bow maker's notebook. It has a picture hand drawn by moi of a paddle bow and an arrow and I used a stone point off of an arrow um, made by an amazing point maker um, war bows of not war bows I'm sorry um, warpath warpath archery he's master of making stone points but anyway the bow maker's notebook written in the spirit of primitive archery with the materials I have a pen and a paper, and so it is handwritten and hand-drawn. Primitive book for primitive archery. I used the materials that I had at hand because I don't have the technology to take photographs and put them into a book. You use what you have, pen and paper, and it's broken into different chapters. Let's see here, where's my cats are going absolutely off their nut because they're out of dry food. see here, table of contents, and so it goes through the equation, and the equation basically is, um, you know, wood plus design plus execution equals bow, and on my chapters, I have a little bit of artwork. This one is rather dry, because, see the equation? It's a fancy, fancy equation, and that basically predicts fatigue, and so I thought that was appropriate. And then the chapter on the equation, it gets into the how the physical properties of wood, woods vary, the design versus manageable stress, executing the design in safe draw lengths. And uh, lest I get into an argument over draw lengths, uh, what I did here is I'm not saying that you can take a soft bow and draw it to half its knock-to-knock -knock length. I have my simple equation just to predict a very safe draw length. And there is a big margin of error, or margin for safety there. Then it gets into bow woods. And I have, oh look at that, that's the chapter for bow woods. Isn't that beautiful? That represents a natural tree stave. Um, looks like elm. Just kidding. And a board. So I put that there. The orientation of growth ring, orientation of growth rings, and that also gets into stave and um, bias ring and edge and all that stuff. So it's boards and staves. Osage mulberry, locust, red elm, juniper, and yew, other assorted conifers, apple service berry, dogwood, hickory, and hop hornbeam, maples, oaks, walnut, and cherry, the elms, the elms, white ash, and birch. And these are bow woods that I'm familiar with, so I have a paragraph and or paragraphs discussing, you know, um, the physical characteristics and the working qualities of each of those woods because I do have familiarity with them. If I don't know it, I didn't write it. And then chapter three, my toolkit, and I get into my shaving bench and a farrier's rasp. Um, which, by the way, don't cheap out on farrier's rasp. You can get a twenty-dollar one, or you can spend more for one made in Italy that's a higher um, carbon that has finer steel. Don't want to be a spoiler, but spend the extra money on a better farrier's rasp. Sanding black blacks, including the big one that mimics a 
lay a, like a, a belt sander that I made at Scribomatic and assorted minor tools. Tellerin stick. Put that there. Design and uh, draw knives and power tools. And there's. Oh, look at that. It's, that's uh, how I draw stuff. That's how I roll. And then it gets into. Intermission, a hunting story, and I'm not going to show you the chapter for that because it's a big surprise. And then the project bows. Project bow number one is the, the bow, and I get into the possible origin of the bow with some nice, cute stories. Bow theory, um, D is for bow staves versus boards, cross sections, finding your tree, splitting and drying staves, roughing out the bow, drawing your lines, outlining a snaky stave, working the face, thinning the bow, working green staves, refining the face, tips and string grooves. I hope I don't have any pictures in this little pile there in here of um, the tips. Forms of tiller, making strings. And again, not photographing, but I'm a pretty fair sketchist. So you should be fine there. Um, forms of, oh, okay, sorry. Rounding the back, board bows. Pre-tillering and tillering, forms of tiller. Um, final tiller, and... Boink, boink, look at that. It's a nice picture. And forms of tiller, and I have like, uh, there's some wonky tillers that I've included, but these are like your typical longbow tiller at the top, and then circular tiller and elliptical tiller explaining those. Drawing an ellipse, because you may want to take a piece of quarter inch plywood or a big piece of cardboard and actually have an ellipse or a series of ellipses for different lengths of bows um, that you can lay it against. You know, you have your tillering tree if you want to be that way. Pull it with the rope and then the bow bends and you can match it on. And this, I des describe in great detail how to actually draw an ellipse that you can put your bow against. Mathematical, but I was a math major. <coughs> Finishing the D bow. And then it gets into Chapter 5, our project bow, number 2, number 2, the long bow. And what I did is the long bow, explain how to do it from a stave, of course, even a snaky stave. But this long bow project is a board bow, so I have first a stave made D bow, and then a board bow, long bow. <coughs> and the long bow, actually, as you will see, the origin of flat belly bows, wood from trees, and boards, laying out your bow templates, tips and handles, thinning your bow, rounding the back, if it is a board bow, tillering and backing, etc., refining the handle, rawhide backing, finishing the bow. So I'm combining a board long bow plus rawhide backing, and my methodology of rawhide backing, and hopefully you can see that, that's a page taken out of the rawhide backing. And I am a very competent rawhide backer, and it's not like glue is dripping all over the place. I have a method that you can actually, although I will tell you to wrap the rawhide with um, gauze, rolled gauze, you can pick up it anywhere. Using my method, you are able to rawhide back a bow without even using wrapping, just your hands. Um, and I've developed a way to do rawhide backing where I actually can sit and watch Netflix, Hawaii Five O, or whatever, on the carpet in my living room and not make a mess. Um, anyway, then it gets into chapter six, project bow number three, the gull wing. And that's gull wing. Three bend bow, northern plains horse bow, or even, you know, Apache bows were um, gull winged. Other people use gull wings. The origin of the gull wing and the evolution of the gull wing, I think that's very interesting. The benefits of the triple bend, working the wood, green wood bending, curing the wood, sinew backing, and then final finishing it, and uh, more drawings. Should have been there it is. And then, following the gullwing, a case study, my paddle bow. And that's exactly it. I kind of explained how I became a paddle bowist, um, thanks to... Primitive Archer Magazine, uh, let's see, Volume 12, Issue 3, 2004, article by Philip Silva of woodbows.com, wrote an article about the paddle bow, 
and I believe they were cloth backed in his article, and that was like a light bulb went off of my head. So I took that um, idea and developed my own design for a paddle ball, and the rest is history. It's like one of those little twists and turns, you know, that you hit in your life, and up till that point, I made bows out of staves, scraping them one at a time, and then saw this idea for a paddle bow, and we were kind of hard pressed financially. It's like, wow. You can make bows out of red oak boards. And the paddle bow is a beautiful design, so I go through my process. And that changed me because I went from making, uh, like a lot of you, you know, bows here and there, to actually making bows in a bigger way. And the paddle bow taught me, basically, design function stresses, how to design bows. And from that, you know, here I am right now. And, and so I give credit for that. And actually, now that this writing project is done, I am going to attempt to submit an article about my paddle ball, giving credit and the twists and turns that led me to this point, submit it to Primitive Archer, which will be nice because um, I'm making two paddle balls that are going to be highly decorated, highly painted, you know, with the geometric patterns. They're going to be gorgeous um, for Warpath fellow that runs Warpath Archery, and he's a bow maker, uh, but we like to sell and trade back and forth, so he's gonna, I'm going to make two paddle bows for him. He makes arrows, beautiful arrows. I make arrows, but I still enjoy getting stuff from other bow makers and arrow makers just as he does, and so um, these two paddle bows I'm making for him will be in the photographs for the Primitive Archer project. Where was I? case study my paddle bow, and then goes, going on to the, this one really wants some dry food, the Boyer's Float. There it is. I'm not going to say where you see pictures of it. I think this is kind of a cutesy thing. If you see the, the hand strap, if these existed in any numbers today, I would know how the hand strap was oriented, and that's why there's question marks right here, or a handle. And so, this somewhat extinct tool, they still use them in Japan for various things, um, is, is a mystery. And so, the Boyer's, the Boyer float, I need to put an S there, of war both things both great and strong and small, of war both things both great and small. And it was a, definitely an English tool. And what I shall do, oh, look at that, how'd this get there? I might not have even shown that, that's as far as, um, you know, lining up the handle and blah, blah, blah. The last paragraph of my book, spoiler alert, in this is in the chapter on um, Boyer's Float. Lest I forget, compared to working you into a narrow, round belly bow, working elm and ash into wider, flat belly bows would make these woods seem mean. It would take a meaner tool to tame them. Thank you and good night. Well, anyway, before the cats wind up chewing my face off, I better head to the store and get some dry food and then start working on making paddle bows for Warpath. Check out Warpath Archery. I'm sure it's warpatharchery.com. He makes great stuff. Hey, Warpath. Um, and begin writing an article I wish to submit to Primitive Archer. And I do think people of Primitive Archer Magazine and Philip Silva for getting me started on this path. You know, in any of our lives we can like trace back where we turned at these intersections that like that caused us to be at this point in time in this place. And uh, how often can you say a magazine article, you know, it made a huge change in your path of life, and in this case, you know, Fern of Archer Magazine made a huge impact on my life, and Philip Silva, um, I don't know, if you happen to watch this video, thank you, thank you so much, because you've had a great impression on my life, a positive one. Um, that's it, I'm going to have another cup of coffee and then head out to the store, thank you, and have a great day. Tiki says thanks for watching. No, Tiki, cats love paper. I wonder how they found it in the jungle.